So do you remember that time when a couple of hostile submarines invaded Sydney Harbour and then fired off some torpedoes and hit the Garden Island Naval Base and destroyed a passenger ferry, killing hundreds of people? You don't? Well, for some reason, it's not something that's well remembered in Australia. But it did actually happen nearly 80 years ago. On the 31st of May in 1942, right in the middle of World War II, that's when a couple of Japanese midget subs slipped into the harbour. The Japanese forces had already attacked Darwin and Broome a few months earlier. But all that was so far away from the big population centres on the East Coast. No one imagined that the Japanese Imperial Navy would be so bold has to sneak into the centre of our biggest metropolis and fire off torpedoes. After the raid, one of the three midget subs disappeared. But in 2006, the wreck of this sub was discovered by some weekend divers. Tim Smith is the Director of Operations at Heritage New South Wales, which manages the site of that sunken submarine. Tim was born long after the incident, but his mum told him the story of how she heard explosions and gunfire on the harbour on that night in 1942 that drove the city into a panic. Hello, Tim. Hi, Richard. Love to be on your program. Tell me about what Sydney was like. What do you know of what was going on in uh, in Sydney that night before all the trouble started? Well, it was a pretty average night. It was the end of the week and a bit bit gloomy and overcast. There, there was a moon out and the city was just doing what it did. It, people were coming back and forward from work late. The manly ferries were running and it was just an, a regular night on the harbour. A lot of, lot of vessels around and, and obviously a lot of naval warships in the harbour as well. It was a very busy place. Now this was after the attack on Pearl Harbour, so the United States was in the war. Were there warships on the harbour that night? Yeah, a number, a number of warships. So we had um, HMAS Canberra, the, um, one of the, the large um, Australian warships, cruiser, uh, but also the heavy cruiser USS Chicago, uh, which had come in from repairs from wartime operations in the Pacific. I um, mean, a number of uh, armed merchantmen, uh, auxiliary cruisers, they were in the harbour, and patrol boats also, they were armed with uh, machine guns and depth charges. So the big ships were the targets, and I, that's why the, the Japanese Imperial Navy uh, set their eyes on Sydney because it was the largest uh, naval port and repair facility uh, left after the fall of Singapore. And then uh, suddenly to have a naval attack force off Sydney that night was uh, quite a surprise to people who were pretty complacent in Sydney at the sort of on the coast uh, at the end of the war outside of the actual um, visibility of the war, really. Yeah, did, did the average Australian on the street have a sense of imminent threat? Was there a sense that Sydney could have been a target for whatever reason? I don't think it was really, from from conversations with my family and people that were around at the time, there was certainly um, a lot of activity. There were, there were vessels coming and going, there were troops coming in and out through Sydney, but no conflict was visible. There was, you know, all that was far north, you know, up in Darwin and Broome, I um, mean, even that was um, reported on fairly quietly because of wartime uh, sensitivities. So the Australian authorities didn't want to spook um, people in the Australian uh, cities and merchant ships were going about their business up and down the coast. There were no convoys requirements at this stage because there had been no submarine activity off the coast uh, until that time, that night. Tim, what do we know then about the capability of the Japanese Navy? I mean, did we know that they had subs and midget subs that could sneak their way in? No, that's a really compelling part of the story. And the Japanese were absolutely leading the field in these covert um, uh, capabilities. There, there wasn't another Navy in the world at the time that had functional midget submarines in a number of other countries. They were still a concept or in development, but the Japanese Navy had actually uh, started um, testing these um, small operating submarines for coastal defence largely um, in the late 1930s. So at the start of the war, the Japanese Navy had a, a number of these craft at their disposal. 
Uh, certainly, they also had a very formidable um, uh, fleet of battleships and heavy cruisers and cruisers and aircraft carriers that were used for great effect on the Pearl Harbor attack. And the midget submarines were first deployed on their first combat operation as part of the attack force on Pearl Harbor. So five submarines were deployed there, and then they were next deployed at Sydney six months later. Tell me about the defences, defence emplacements we had there at the heads where the Sydney Harbour meets the Pacific Ocean to detect if any submarines were trying to sneak their way into Sydney Harbour. Well, I guess the description for those is probably unfinished <laughs> um, <laughs> because Sydney was oh, such a, an important port, a big harbour. It's a complex harbour to navigate because of um, eddies and channels and currents. There was a net that was being built across the harbour entrance as a precaution, but Sydney Harbour being uh, fairly shallow, they, they didn't ex really expect ocean-going submarines to make a, a, an attack deep into Sydney Harbour, so the net was built more or less across the entrance of the main channels between Watson's Bay and Mosman. Um, but that was unfinished, so there were there were two big gates in that net that hadn't been built, so there were 400-metre openings that were um, absolutely passable by um, the midget submarines, and that's exactly what they did. They headed for those entrances um, and followed in the case of... Um, the midget submarine M24, uh, a manly ferry, allegedly through one of those openings as a guide. And there were some strange things called indicator loops. And these are big wires, big copper wires, insulated wires that were placed underwater at the entrance to the harbour. And they had an electric current that was passed through them uh, and that was connected to a little signal hut on shore. So if a, a metal vessel went over those indicator loops, that metal hulls registered an additional signature and um, that could be used to signal that something maybe was coming in or out of the harbour. But again, they were unfinished and only uh, two out of the eight uh, loops that were placed on, on the sea floor were actually operational at the time. Had there been any signs in the days leading up to the raid that a raid was coming? Well, there had actually been a, a few pointers, and, you, and you're looking back now, and hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? But mm -hmm. uh, there, were, there were a number of clues that something big was afoot. Um, the naval authorities, they'd picked up chatter, um, radio um, communications between what they thought were you know, Japanese warships off the Australian coast. And again, they weren't exactly sure where that might have been, but there was obviously some radio communication between the, the five carrier submarines as part of the attack force. Also, uh, just a couple of days before the raid, a, a light aircraft took off from one of the submarines that carried aircraft. And there were two of those, the I-27 and the I-29. Hang so on. I what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean by aircraft being launched from submarines? Well, this is one of the other tricks that the Japanese Navy had up their sleeve. They'd already developed uh, hangars on board um, the ocean-going long-range submarines to accommodate a, a folded-up aircraft. And, yeah, as I said, two, two of the um, five majors, you know, the big submarines from the attack force, carried a little single-wing float plane with two floats and, and two crew, and they, they, can, they literally <laughs> wheel them out of the hangars, open the wings, fire them up and, and take off within you know, five or ten minutes. It was an amazing technology. These were seaplanes, what, in kit form they carried in the subs and what assembled them yeah, on yeah, the water. Yeah, um, fully functioning, yeah, folded wings, and they opened up their, their hangars and they were catapulted off the front decks of these, these submarines and could fly around and then they could be recovered alongside the um, submarine and craned back on board, folded up and... Um, and and away they went. Well, let me ask you the question now. <laughs> if the Japanese are sending reconnaissance seaplanes out and around Sydney Harbour, wasn't that noticed at the time? Didn't people go, oh, my goodness, there's a Japanese reconnaissance plane? That's a little bit unusual. Um, <laughs> well, the trick with that was no one expected them, one of the Japanese um, Navy to be offshore from Sydney or Newcastle or Wollongong, um, and they certainly didn't expect them to fly float planes in and, and do a, a, a recce around the harbour. But that's exactly what they did, and you know, the I-29 launched its float plane on the 23rd of May. Uh, it flew over Sydney, um, looked at the warships in the harbour, made some records, and just two nights before the actual raid, um, the I-21 launched its float plane, and its pilot Ito, um, the navigator, flew right around Sydney Harbour twice, and you know up to the Harbour Bridge, 
and some of the army gun stations around the harbour made a record of a float plane flying around, but they just presumed it was one of the American aircraft from possibly US Chicago. The Chicago had four float planes on its decks and they just put two and two together, oh, that must be one of ours, and, and didn't really twig that the Japanese were already in Sydney and flying low over <laughs> over um, South Head, uh, over the lighthouse at Macquarie Lighthouse, over Garden Island Naval Base, and, and making a map of where all the warships were positioned. That's just blown my mind. When they were ready to press go on the mission and launch the set of midget subs into Sydney Harbour. Where did they launch them from? Was it from a, a ship offshore or, or a much larger sub? Yeah, the five carrier submarines actually met several weeks earlier in Truck Lagoon in Micronesia in the middle of the Pacific. And there the, the three submarines that were going to carry the midgets to Sydney loaded their midgets on, on the rear deck. They were clamped onto the rear deck. And the five submarines individually went from the Pacific down through Indonesian waters and rendezvoused off Sydney just a couple of nights before the raid. And that led to the attack on the 31st of May when the th- three midget submarines were deployed off Sydney to about, about eight, eight or ten kilometres straight off the heads. Take me inside this submarine. What were conditions like? How many crew did they hold in these, little, in these midget subs? Oh, they, they were tiny craft. They're only really 24 metres in length and uh, they were only a two-man crew. Um, the crew could only actually stand up in the, in the central conning tower area. It was a very confined space. They, they could walk up and down the submarine through a very narrow passageway, but it was through banks of 208 batteries and the torpedo room at the front, which held these two um, Type 97 special torpedoes. And they were a lethal design also. They were specially made smaller torpedoes than the, than the fleets had, but they packed a whopping 350 pounds of TNT in each warhead. So they were big enough to certainly sink um, a battleship. So very effective weapon systems. So claustrophobic two-man submarines, each armed with a couple of torpedoes. For the men on board, was it a suicide mission? Was it understood to be a suicide mission? No, absolutely not. Not in that early part of the war. I guess the interpretation here that is important, the, the crews certainly wrote letters home before they deployed, when they were sitting on the carrier submarines before they crawled into their midgets, and said they expected to die in the attack. And, and look, that was more because of the incredible dangers that were ahead of them to get into a an enemy harbour that was defended, that we had these defences being constructed. It was highly likely that they even if they were successful, would not recover or you know, might be attacked and sunk in the combat operation. But at the time, they were the elite crew of the Navy. They had all done three years, um, you know, up to three years of training in Japan and some active training for their specific chosen mission for over a couple of months prior. So, well, today we'd probably equate them as the SAS, the elite sort of um, arm of, of the army. They were highly technically trained. And for that reason, they were not meant to be dispensable. They were meant to be recovered so they could um, be redeployed at a, a later time. Although the midget submarines were never meant to be recovered and brought home to Japan. They were to be sunk uh, after the raid, uh, scuttled. Um, they had demolition charges on board to blow um, holes in the submarine to sink them so they could never be captured. But the crews were in the early part of the war um, were actually ordered by Admiral Yamamoto, the Supreme Naval Commander, to be recovered. And that was the orders of the day at that time. Podcast, broadcast, and online. This is Conversations with Richard Feidler on ABC Radio. Subscribe to the Conversations podcast. To find out more, just head to abc.net.au slash conversations. So these Japanese submariners are in this tiny craft that's chugging along with electric engines underwater, heading towards the heads of Sydney Harbour. What orders did they have? What were they looking for to shoot? 
Really, the, the, the main order was to go for the, the capital ships, the, the heavily armed major naval warships in the harbour. So they knew there were at least two or three targets of, of, of merit. So that was, that was their mission to come and attack those and sink them. And you can imagine the impact of that if they had been successful. Vessel like um, the Canberra, Chicago, heavily armed warship, huge magazines of ammunition for their major guns on board. If they'd sunk and blown up one of those targets in the harbour, it could have taken out the whole city of the explosion from one warship alone. So, um, and also block the harbour from use by having a big ship sunk on the on the harbour floor. So, Pearl Harbour showed that they had very good uh, attack strategies in terms of secrecy and surprise, and they were deploying all of that at Sydney. So it just makes me wonder, what, as you say, what would have happened if the USS Chicago had been destroyed? The, the explosion might have taken out what, a part of the CBD and part of the foreshore settlements and the houses and apartments all along there. Is that what you mean? Yeah, and there, there were also um, the major ships ranked around the Garden Island Naval Base. And Obviously, these ships are carrying you know, hundreds and hundreds of crude too, so the, the human impact would have been very real. So then there's the first of the subs that got through past the heads into Sydney Harbour, M27. Was it picked up by those metal detectors you were talking about, those indicator loops? Was its entry seen by the detection systems? Uh, that that one not so readily. One of the things that actually went against the the Japanese, they, they, even though they had a very um, calculated um, attack sequence and mission, and they had the technology, they were thwarted by the sea conditions. And and what seems to have happened, even though the midgets were launched by the three carrier subs, you know, off Sydney heads, they seem to have taken an inordinate amount of time to make you know that eight or ten kilometre passage and. We don't know if that was because of navigation difficulties. You can imagine these are tiny little submarines with a little periscope not far off the waterline. They didn't have a big field of view, so they were going through choppy seas. They probably had a bit of a southerly swell on them. They were notoriously difficult to control and keep submerged anyway, and uh, it took them a long time to come into the harbour. So even though they, we think they were deployed around 5.30 or 6 at night in an array, yeah, you know, the first one, um, Midgets um, 27, didn't make it into the harbour till 8 o'clock. So it took them probably two hours of labouring through the ocean to get to the entrance to Sydney Harbour, find their way in through the heads and then start their attack. But this one actually snuck through and it didn't get detected or picked up until it was spotted trapped in the net and... That's where the whole mission started unravelling. How was it spotted by trapped in a net? Well, uh, again, everybody was just going about their business, but um, luckily for the um, defenders of Sydney, there was a, a night watchman, um, James Cargill, who was part of the Maritime Services Board, and he was in a little rowboat, and he was charged that night to just be looking after the net that was uh, the anti-submarine net that was under construction. So he spent his night on the harbour and was just going up and down the net just checking things were okay and then about eight o'clock he saw a bit of a wiggle in the net <laughs> rode over to it and looked down and went goodness that's unusual <laughs> and saw the sh- a shape of a, a, a you know tubular shape un- underwater mm. with a conning tower and actually the bow of this submarine that would have poked out of out of the water you can imagine what was running through his mind at the time. He was, you know, disbelief, and he thought, this is a bit odd, i better report it. So he rode his rowboat back along the net to the central area where the, there was a fleet of small craft. They called them the Hollywood Fleet. So they were, they were um, personal sort of um, um, vessels that um, had been fitted out for naval use and some of them had been armed with depth charges and searchlights and machine guns. And he rode, rode, rode over to one of these and uh, said... I think there's something over there in the net. And this was um, HMAS Yaroma. That vessel followed him down, so he rode all the way back down along the net again. And it's about 8, 8 15 at night by this stage. <laughs> and um, they looked at it from a much bigger ship and went, I think you're right. I think there's something there. <laughs> So they, they zip back and try to get a message to the, the shore facilities to say, we think there's something in the harbour here. It looks like a submarine. They call it a baby submarine. That was the, the, the account in the records. And um, for some reason, that message took hours to get to the naval commander. Let's talk about him now. The naval. Where was the naval commander that night of the attack? 
Well, he was at a party, um, well, allegedly. Um, <laughs> the crews were feverishly trying to work out what this target was down the other end of the harbour, trying to get these messages to Garden Island and the naval establishment to say, look, there's something afoot here, you need to put the harbour on a bit of alert. But there wasn't any particular movement with the Rear Admiral Muirhead Gould and his staff till around about 11 o'clock at night. So we're talking this first midget submarine was spotted just after 8 p.m., but they really didn't organise a considered defence till about, you know, 11, really, you know, in terms of the naval command. And the message wasn't widely broadcast so that everybody in the harbour knew for, for some hours later. So the first sub got spotted then, as you said, the um, M27 got caught in the net and that had been spotted. Um, yeah. What happened to that sub when, when those patrol boats went out to investigate? Well, they, they were trying to get this command um, authorization to attack the submarine, so they ended up taking um, things to their own hand and, and commencing an attack themselves. So Euroma was joined by another small um, some pleasure craft called the Lolita. Lolita came alongside and immediately dropped two depth charges they did had on its rear deck uh, near the target. So what uh, happened when those depth charges were dropped? They didn't go off. Oh, um, right. The depth charges work um, on the pressure of water, so when they get to a certain preset depth, the fuse will go, a primer, and they'll detonate the main charge. They were dropped in a part of the harbour that's pretty shallow, so uh, around where the net was was only really about 20 metres of water, and they dropped these two depth charges um, with the charge setting too, too deep, so they, the hydrostatic pressure valve never went off. They, they never detonated. So that took up a, a bit of time. So, it was, you know, they were looking at the target, trying to observe what was going on. They could see the submarine or the crew of the submarine were actively trying to get out of the net. And two small propellers at the rear of the craft, contra-rotating propellers. What, what seems to have befallen this submarine is it had tried to sneak through the open western gate of the net um, and not far ahead of there was the pile light, the lit um, timber structure that marked the, the Western Channel entrance um, up to Sydney. Um, maybe they thought they were going to run into that, so they seemed to have probably reversed. And when they reversed, they reversed into the completed part of the net oh, and right. got the propellers fouled in the, the linked chain, the stainless steel um, mesh in the net, and they became hopelessly fouled. They had these surface craft now actively um, motoring around them on the surface, you know, dropping depth charges. Whether, whether they knew that at the time, we'll never know. So given that they were stuck in the net and they couldn't get out, what did the crew of the M27 do? Well, they would have been in, in, a, in a whole lot of um, deep discussion. You know, they were visibly um, seen. That they would have known that part of their craft was above the water. There was no way they were going to conceal themselves. Uh, these submarine crews were specially trained that if they were detected in a combat operation, they were to sink on the bottom and then drive off at 90 degrees and then sit somewhere for half an hour. That was their way of evading uh, observation or, or, you know, or, or surface craft hunting for them. But they couldn't do that? But they couldn't do that. They were hopelessly stuck. They knew they had no option but to remove any evidence of the craft that might have been useful to the Allies. And they had the demolition charges on board. So, look, um, with all the, the craft buzzing around on the surface, the two crew, they would have been looking at all of their options. Technical records of the craft when it was recovered uh, showed they'd actually tried to detonate um, both demolition charges. Now, these were canisters that were both in the forward compartment and one in the rear compartment in the passageway. They were like a small little beer keg full with explosives, uh, about 30 kilograms of shimozi powder, which is a sort of TNT with detonators. Um, they were wired up to batteries, but they could also be lit by a, a wick, like a, a fuse. The rear one never went off, but the front one they did successfully detonate. That's a major explosion inside such a small craft which instantly killed the two crew and, and severely damaged the, the submarine. It basically blew the forward bow section out and, and ahead of the, of the submarine and destroyed most of the forward part up to the control room. So what did the Australian boats on the surface see then with this explosion? Did that sort of erupt right onto the surface of the water then? 
Yeah, look, it's a really interesting um, and important point because the Lolita was coming in for another one of its depth charge runs at the time as the submarine uh, detonated its, in, its own in explosives. And there's some compelling arguments from researchers over the years that it was probably trying to take out the Lolita. They knew they were going to kill themselves. Uh, they knew the game was up and they were probably thinking um, to take out at least one enemy warship with them, even if it was only a, a patrol craft. Uh, and the Lolita was actually blown out of the water, lifted up on the, the blast wave from the explosion. No, no crew were, were injured in that, but... It looks like they were probably having trying to have that effect, and you can imagine in that very tense environment, you know, they were counting down minutes, they were looking at all their options, they only had one option left, and what were they going to do with those final minutes and opportunities? But the explosion was an enormous one and resonated around the harbour, and it really, it makes you think nowadays, um, you know, if looking back on that, how many people heard that, and what, what did that actually mean for the defence of the harbour. It certainly signalled that submarines actually were in this. It was no drill. This was not a, a false alarm, a false sighting. People had actually seen a submarine and now it had blown itself up in the, you know, the entrance to Sydney Harbour. Podcast, broadcast and online. This is Conversations with Richard Feitler. So, Tim, you said the first Japanese midget sub got caught in a net at the heads of Sydney Harbour and then the crew detonated their own sub, killing themselves, rather than be captured. But then there was a second sub, M24, that slipped into the harbour. How was that sub getting on? Well, this one actually did trip the indicator loops and those coils that I mentioned that were inside the harbour entrance. So there was a signature reading and that suggested that 9.48pm another midget submarine had crossed into the harbour and it was M24. And it was commanded by actually the most junior of the Japanese commanders, that's uh, Katsuhisa Ban, and he had a petty officer aboard, Moro Shibe. Now, Ban was only 23 years old and he was known to be quite a easy uh, person to talk to, always a jokester, but also very committed and very passionate about um, his country and his, his naval um, role. And you can see that in the tenacity of the way he brought his submarine into the harbour. As I said, it was, was detected in indicator loops, but not particularly picked up by authorities. He seems to have followed a manly ferry through the open gate on the eastern channel. So he tailgated uh, behind a manly ferry. Though. Yeah, about uh, 10 o'clock at night. There's some, there's some anecdotal reports of people that were on board a ferry that saw a periscope behind them in the way because they went up the harbour from Manly to Circular Quay. And what was it looking for once it got into the harbour and it was ready to fire at will upon whatever targets it could find? So they had actually gone right up the harbour to the city without being detected at all. An amazing piece of seamanship and navigation. They weren't sighted again till an hour later, about 11 o'clock. And when they were sighted, guess where they were? Right alongside USS Chicago. But was the sub spotted from the deck of the US warship? Yeah, they absolutely were. 10.52 p.m., officers and, and, and watch crew aboard Chicago saw the M24's conning tower about 500 metres off their beam. So that is not a good position for a, a cruiser to be in. And uh, you have to remember they were not powered up. They were at Anchorage at night, reduced crew. Uh, the commander, Captain Bodie, was ashore, possibly with <laughs> Muir Head Gould, the naval commander of Sydney Harbour at a dinner party. Uh, so the ship was in command of the next highest ranking officer. Uh, they made immediate preparations to go into action stations and uh, as soon as they saw it, that it was indeed a submarine, they, they opened up their guns on the M24 right in the centre of Sydney Harbour. Yeah, it must and, have been uh, like madness there for a moment if they're firing these huge guns at such close range at the vessel in the water right beside them. 
Yeah, absolutely. They were so close that these guns, were, they couldn't be depressed low enough to hit the target. And so they were shooting off shells that were bouncing off the water and flying up into Taronga Zoo. And uh, one of these shells um, ricocheted off the water and hit Fort Denison, the Martello Tower that you see in the middle of yeah. um, Sydney Harbour. Uh, and there's actually still a chip in the stone on the Martello Tower from a five-inch shell fired at M24 as this melee was going on. They were firing um, anti-aircraft machine guns from the crew at the target. Were there Australian ships firing upon them as well? While Chicago opened up on them, so did two Australian warships, the Wyala um, Corvette and HMS Geelong. So they they were now actively firing at this target as well. And uh, one of the, one of the uh, crew on board Chicago allegedly got out his Colt forty five <laughs> pistol, his handgun. This is Ensign Bruce Simmons, and and fired that at the M twenty four. So this is we're talking like hand to hand combat. I thought that only happened in movies, to where people just be you know, American officers pull out a handgun and go ping. Yeah. Ping, ping. Pow, the, pow. Yeah, yeah, right. But this actually did happen, did it? Right, right. in the middle of the harbour. And, right. And for people in Sydney at the time, they must have been wondering what the heck was going on. Um, by now, the explosion of Tumid's midget had occurred. There was a huge blast down the entrance to the harbour. Now we're up in the, in the city itself and there's um, gunfire, explosions, you know, searchlights, flares, so light up to the harbour's surface. There's a gun duel, a gun battle going on with a midget submarine right in the middle of all this. And they were whipping up white water from the shells, from the smaller arm fires all around M24, uh, which immediately dived out of sight. And then it disappeared for another period. So the M24 that was being fired upon in Sydney Harbour, it had torpedoes. Was it able to fire any of those torpedoes? Well, they submerged. And the next thing we know, about half an hour later... Two torpedoes are seen racing across the surface, actually bouncing across the surface of Sydney Harbour towards USS Chicago. They went alongside Chicago and missed the target. And uh, one of those uh, washed ashore on Garden Island, ran up ashore on some old rope uh, at the end of uh, Garden Island Naval Base at the gun wharf. Didn't explode, but the other one went past Chicago under the cuttable ferry, which was a, a depot ferry used for sailors to sleep on at night if they were between ship deployments, and that 350-pound uh, warhead exploded against the seawall underneath the cuttable and blew the cuttable out of the water, broke its back and threw it back in the water and, and destroyed the harbour ferry. And the impact of that explosion was catastrophic. It, it killed 21 sailors on board and injured another 10 severely. So... It was pandemonium at that stage alongside the naval base at Garden Island. Uh, and somewhere out there, there was a submarine that was now trying to evade and get away from the targets and escape. Uh, about an hour later, just before 2 a.m., uh, there was another signature on those indicator loops at the entrance to the harbour saying a target had passed over it on the outward way. So he actually got out of the harbour. So then in the early hours, a third submarine entered the harbour. How was that progressing? Well, it came into the entrance to the harbour and it was spotted pretty soon by the um, HMAS Loriana. Uh, they sent an alert to say there was another submarine in the harbour and the anti-submarine vessel HMAS Yandra came onto the scene. The Yandra was another small craft. It actually attempted to ram the submarine. It was on the surface coming in at the time, but they lost contact uh, until about 11 o'clock and they saw it again and they dropped six depth charges on it. So here we go again in the middle of the harbour, you know, 11 o'clock at night, there are six depth charges successfully detonating at the entrance to the harbour. Great plumes of water and explosive force at that time uh, and they lost it. They thought they'd destroyed it. But lo and behold, it had sat on the bottom so the crew must have been recovering from the damage they obviously hit the bottom hard because when the submarine was recovered, the cage around the, the torpedo tubes was dented, so it possibly hit the ground hard. And they didn't come back up onto the surface till uh, almost 3 a.m. in the morning. And guess what <laughs> came alongside them? 
It's just almost 3 a.m. They were still struggling to enter the harbour. USS Chicago came charging down the harbour. It had powered up, left its mooring and was now exiting the harbour in an emergency with the USS Perkins, a destroyer escort and a number of other vessels. And Chicago almost rammed this midget struggling still on the surface. What, by accident, you mean? Just by crashing into it? Absolute accident. It was racing out and this one was fumbling to come in and, you know, whether Chicago gave it a glancing blow, there was some some suggestions of that. Was the Chicago just simply... just trying to get the hell out of Sydney Harbour before it could be sunk by one of these midgets. Yeah, the orders were to, to exit, get, get up steam, you know, power up the boilers, and that wasn't a small task. That took several hours so, to get um, yeah, them yeah. to ready. So, so in this process of trying to flee from the midget subs, it then goes boom right into it. <laughs> yeah, it yeah, almost, almost took it out. Uh, so. so the second sub escaped through the heads at Sydney Harbour. What about the third sub? How was that faring in its attack? Well, they actually managed to get through the boom net and got into the harbour and they were spotted around Robertson's Bay near the area of Taronga Zoo and then they disappeared again. They were next seen on the same Mosman side of the harbour in um, Taylor's Bay at about 5am and daylight was starting to break. So we've got a midget submarine tucked in a very dark cove in Sydney Harbour and some eyewitness reports from, from Sydney siders suggested they might have seen a, a, a man walking along the outer casing of the submarine looking at the bow. And perhaps that was one of the crew of this midget looking to see what the damage was it has sustained. And we know from later accounts that they actually had fired their torpedoes at a target in Sydney Harbour. But because of the damage to the net guards, they they blocked the torpedoes exiting the torpedo tube. So... Again, uh, there's a, a warship in Sydney that was very lucky. It had obviously been lined up as a target fired at, um, but it was an unsuccessful attack. This is now the third sub that's come into Sydney Harbour. There's been a large explosion from one of the subs. There's been gunfire from USS Chicago. There's been torpedoes fired, ferry destroyed, Garden Island base attacked. Has the whole city been woken up by this? Is there panic? What's going on in the city at this time? Well, I think there are plenty of people on, on harbour ferries that were just watch, watching it all as part of the, their um, journey home from work in the early hours of the night. But certainly there was enough commotion and the explosions that people, you know, maybe some people thought it was a naval drill or an exercise, or a defence exercise, but there were a lot of people that came out to watch and just reports of people around the headlands observing all this through the middle of the night. And by daybreak, the city knew there had been a major incident. But it was still going on. We're talking 5 a.m. here, and the third midget's only finally been captured on the surface, and it's now under sustained attack by three uh, of these surface craft, the Steady Hour Sea Mist and Neuroma. Uh, and in all, they dropped something like 19 depth charges from 5 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. after the attack in and around the stricken submarine. Those blasts were enormous. You know, there was no concealing them. There were people living up above in the streets above this bay actively watching this activity. Now, I mentioned your mum right at the start. Um, what did she tell you about, about this, her experience of this attack? Well, my, my mum's 88, and she was a 10-year-old girl at the time living a bit further around the corner in a unit at Cremorne Point. And they were told very early on in the raid, and it was probably around the 10, 10.30 at night, and they were told by their mother and father to hide under the uh, the table in the hallway. And um, quite amazing, I think my mother or her sister bumped the table and some oranges fell off the table, and apparently that caused great <laughs> consternation because they, they thought a shell had come through the house. But no, right. it was only some oranges. <laughs> How was that final midget sub brought down, Tim? A little craft like that had no hope against ex- massive explosive force of, of depth charges. You know, these were to be deployed off ships at deep water to sink large ocean-going submarines. Here we've got a 46-ton little submarine was actually seen to be thrown out of the water with one of the early blasts. You can imagine what it was like inside that for the two crew. It would have been horrific. Um, the explosions, the, the percussion force. We, we think they probably... Um, killed themselves early on in that. They actually tried again to fire the demolition charges. That failed, and in the end, the senior officer shot um, his crewmate in the head and then turned the pistol on himself and committed suicide himself. 
what a gruesome end. I mean, these two men in this tiny little sub beneath the water being rung like a bell, I suppose, un- underwater yeah. in these claustrophobic con- conditions, and they decide to turn their pistols on themselves. It's pretty grim, no, isn't it? No other option. So that was the end of the end of the subs. What about the rear admiral you mentioned? How well had he grasped the nature of this emergency throughout this crisis? Um, look, he had been appointed to um, defend Sydney Harbour and set up the defences. And uh, we're talking, you know, five carrier submarines and three midgets, so eight submarines. About 500 Imperial Japanese Navy crew were off Sydney that night. I don't think anyone anticipated that in 1942, that that could even happen. Look, I think on that night, that everybody was caught out. He was at a dinner party. You know, by the time he came uh, to Garden Island Naval, base you know, around midnight. Captain Bodie from the Chicago came back on board his craft around you know, 11, 11.30 in the middle of this gunfight with the midget submarine M24. Yeah, there was a lot of sort of reflection on what could have been done better. And uh, one, one thing Muirhead Gould did that was highly um, challenged at the time, but in hindsight, people have given him a lot of respect for it. When the, the naval forces found that the, the destroyed submarines, the two midget submarines in the harbour and recovered those and interrogated them. They obviously had to remove the four crew that were killed on board those vessels. Um, and they were given a full military funeral uh, with rifle fire salute. And that was done publicly. It was recorded on film at the time. And then information was provided to the Japanese government. Uh, and the bodies were actually repatriated uh, cremated and sent back on ships and then connected with a Japanese naval um, merchant um, vessel and taken back to Japan in the middle of the war. Why was that done, do you think? Well, um, Muirhead Gould was, one, recognising the valour and courage of these servicemen and, look, it created um, a lot of havoc and, and killed, you know, 21 uh, sailors and, and yeah. the impacts of those families were astounding. But... They were doing a mission as the Allies were doing on the other side and they were recognised for their bravery. Um, Muirhead Gould also wanted to send a very important message that Australians would look after war dead from all sides respectfully uh, and they were hoping out of that gesture that um, any Australian POWs and British POWs and the like would also be, be treated with respect. Well, how sad it didn't as, pan out that way, did. though. Once they recovered the wrecks of two of the subs... What did they find inside? Well, the ones from Sydney were the most documented in terms of the technology and the fit-out and the engineering capability of the craft. Um, But they also had a a lot of um, uh, small finds in there. There were mementos from the families, Japanese families, to the crew, which they took on board in the final mission with them. Um, you know, there were you know, hand-woven belts. There were ceremonial swords that were on board. There were bottles of sake. So what happened to the wrecks? once they were discovered? Well, those two were recovered and put on Clark Island in Sydney Harbour and they took them apart and uh, looked at every aspect of them, from the demolition charges to the the um, technology and the periscopes to the compasses and the radio equipment and the batteries and their serviceability. And so all of that was very rich data. They must have had trophy value. Were they put on display and toured around Australia during the war? Yes, they, they, because of the, the nature of the explosions on those two craft, they couldn't have two um, complete um, submarines on display, so they put bits of the two together, and that was actually on display immediately after. That went on the back of a lorry, you know, even down to Melbourne for war bond schemes, so people were encouraged to contribute money to the defence of of Australia through this scheme and that toured around for a number of months and then uh, eventually it was uh, donated to the War Memorial. It was on outside display for a number, number of years and in more recent times brought inside the, the gallery space and completely refurbed and um, is now one of the best displayed composite midget submarines <laughs> in the world. Tim, how did this attack affect the psychology of Australians? Well, I think it certainly it rammed home that nowhere now was safe. This was a world war. Every theatre was at risk of being engaged in it. So Sydney was no longer a supply port or a transitioning port for soldiers or a repair um, port for shipping. It was a target that could be attacked again, perhaps. So I think it really heightened people's awareness that the war was real. It had an ancillary effect um, in terms of... Uh, people being worried about their families and their kids and you know, quite a few reports of, of, of children being sent over the Blue Mountains to schools after the raid. 
There's anecdotal reports about property price changes. Yes. Eastern suburbs. Well, I, I was going to ask you about that because I did hear that that story. Someone once told me a story that it was the Japanese midget sub attack on Sydney Harbour that allowed artists and all sorts of creative people to move into the Kings Cross Potts Point area because the wealthy people of Sydney moved into the the Upper North Shore to wealthy properties up there instead. And so, for the first time, and it's <laughs> been all too brief, Harbourside Sydney became an affordable, if slightly more dangerous postcode for people to live in. Well, look, I think some of that's probably urban folklore, but there was certainly, look, that, that came out not so much from the three submarines inside the harbour, but two of the, the, the submarines involved in the attack, the I-24, that actually launched Midget 24, the one that was found, um, and um, one of the carrier um, um, you know, submarines, the I-21, um, they went off, um, the whole attack force went off and started sinking shipping after that, and they were quite successful. It was the first of four waves of Japanese submarines were then deployed along the eastern coast of Australia up until 1943, and mm-hmm. they sank about 19 ships and damaged another 10 as part of those operations that came out of this raid. But they, those two submarines, when they, they, they waited off Sydney for any of the submariners to come back out to their range rendezvous, when they knew none of those crews survived, uh, two days later, they went on this deployment, and within a week of the raid, the I-24 came and shelled Sydney, so it fired about 10 shells from off um, South Head into um, eastern suburbs. Fortunately, most of those didn't explode because they were um, high-explosive armour-piercing shells, so they <laughs> didn't detonate. And I-21 similarly went off Newcastle the same night and fired some some shells into what you know they thought may have been BHP as a target. And Again, that's an interesting insight into the, the 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 feelings of probably on board the attack force when they knew the three submarines and the six submariners had all been killed in this mission. Uh, some of these carrier support submarines did the parting shot and uh, fired into Sydney and fired into Newcastle and then went off on convoy attacks against merchant shipping. This doesn't seem to be a well-remembered story the story of the Japanese submarine attack on Sydney Harbour. Is that what you're finding? I, I think uh, it's like all history, unless it's talked about and, re- and reflected upon, you know, within a generation and particularly two generations or more, it can become not remembered, not recalled. And I think it's important to recognise what occurred in the past. This was something that happened to Sydney. It was a, a national and an international event at the time. But it's part of what Sydney is. It's part of the, that layering of history and memory, a pastime in, in Sydney's life. I just have to, one more thing to ask you, Tim, and it seems a slightly silly question. Were any animals injured at Taronga Park Zoo? Uh, no. No? <laughs> USS Chicago's crew were, were awfully concerned for the welfare of some animals. <laughs> um, they, actually, some of the crew went round to Taronga Zoo the next day because they thought they must have killed some of the animals. And just finally, finally, Tim... Two of the subs were destroyed and sunk and the two halves were put together and taken around the country as a kind of a war trophy. But what about the third sub, the M24, the one that successfully attacked Garden Island and HMAS Cuttable and then escaped through the heads back into the Pacific Ocean? What was the final fate of that submarine? It is one of the enduring mysteries when M24 and, and Ban and Ashibe successfully exited from sinking the Cuttable, they got out of the harbour about 2am. This particular midget submarine was told to go north and to rendezvous with its carrier submarine off Broken Bay. So that's where everyone assumed it had gone, but then it completely disappeared. No one knew what had happened to it for decades. No one knew where they went. Did they go straight out the heads? Did they go south to a rendezvous? Did they go north? that was missing for all of those years until it was stumbled across by divers back in 2006 off the northern beaches of Sydney, off um, Newport, Bungan Head. Um, we could then piece that final puzzle together. What had happened to the crew? The two crew were uh, almost certainly inside that wreck. They were either overcome by an event inside the craft, either ran out of oxygen or maybe they had some battery fumes, poisonous fumes. They were almost certainly almost out of electric power by the time they got to that position. The next morning, it would have been daybreak by the time they got up to the northern beaches, they would have known they couldn't have stayed on the surface because they would have been seen by um, aircraft that was now searching for any any submarines off the coast. Uh, They couldn't sit on the bottom for another 12 hours to wait for a recovery the next morning. 
and quite possibly they realised the game was up for them as well and, and almost certainly used the service revolver to end their lives. It weren't the bodies discovered in the wreck of the No, site? no, we, we haven't been able to get inside that craft and for all oh. of those reasons and, and, and re, you know, remembrance and sanctity of the war dead, we have made a, a management decision not to probe inside the submarine and that's partly with the wishes of the family of those two men in Japan today, the Japanese and the Australian governments and the New South Wales governments, very respectful of those wishes. Um, the submarine's filled with sand anyway, drift sand that's come through corrosion holes in the hull, and it's highly likely we will we'll never be able to interrogate the interior properly and safely. And uh, we manage it as a war grave, but also as a marker that that M24 is the only one of the three midget submarines that attack Sydney. It's still in its battle context, you know, where it fell in combat on the 1st of June 1942. And the significance of that site is where it sits on the seabed off, off Sydney, and we manage it with those values in mind. Tim, it's an amazing story. Thank you so much for sharing it with us today. No, it's been an absolute pleasure. For more like this, hit subscribe or check out the ABC Listen app for podcasts ad-free.